Sri Lanka is an island that lies just off the southeastern coast of India. A former British colony, it gained its independence in 1948, and soon after, an intense political debate began as to how the new nation would accommodate its two major ethnic groups. The Sinhalese, who are a 72% majority, and the Tamils, who are a 14% minority, disagreed on the kind of government that should rule the country. The Tamils, fearing continued oppression at the hands of the Sinhalese, wanted a government that would ensure against discrimination. Some even demanded that a separate Tamil homeland be established in the north and east of the country. A satisfactory solution was never reached, and in 1983, after more than 35 years of political debate, the country erupted into civil war. Twenty-three years later, this conflict has claimed more than 65,000 lives. Most of the dead are civilians. In 2002, the Tamil rebels and the Sri Lankan government signed a ceasefire agreement. Though open hostilities ended, both the rebels and the government continue to commit acts of politically motivated violence. Because the media gives people the information that they need to wage war or make peace, it has a crucial role to play in any conflict. But in Sri Lanka, the media has become a weapon. Both sides of the conflict see winning the war of information as crucial to their own victory. Providing people with the truth has become less important than gaining popular support, and both sides will go to great lengths to control the kind of information that reaches the newsstands. Because of this, journalists who report on the conflict often become targets of threats and violence themselves. On April 28, 2005, Dharmarat Nam Sivaram, Sri Lanka's most famous Tamil journalist, became such a target. I think one of the things that we have noticed a lot is that you move into a self-censorship mode and uh, you begin to think twice about what you publish and what you don't publish. And that's terrible for journalists. And it's terrible for the freedom of expression. Yeah? When you have serious journalists who begin to think twice about what can I put down on paper and what not. Uh, newspaper editors become far more cautious uh, publishers who are investing the money in newspapers become far more cautious, and your family members are terrified. You see, when there is an uh, armed struggle, always a journalist will be the first target. Well, always. I suddenly woke up in a dream, seeing Sivaram with his with a disjointed hand. Then I was wondering what this all meant. And I was wondering whether it was it was to suppress him as a writer. Writing the truth and writing what you really understand, what you see, is putting yourself into risk. I found myself, you know, when I go home, looking over my shoulder before I open my gate and that sort of thing. And I, and I didn't sleep easy during the night. It's a process. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, wiping out every single person who are willing to fight. All the journalists that you speak to, you know, after Siva's killing, will tell you about how their wives and their kids start to, and their mothers and their fathers start talking to them about, like, you know, do you really have to do this? A tragic situation has arisen in Sri Lanka. The press freedom is at stake. The very existence, especially of Tamil newspaper institutions, is threatened. The Tamil journalists are demoralized and they fear for their lives. I cannot really imagine a society without the freedom of press because 
we will never be able to understand the other man's point of view. And not only that, to express our own points of view. But unfortunately in Sri Lanka, my friends, this has not happened. Everything is twisted. Everything is turned on its head, turned on its back. Damarat Nam Sivaram was born in Batakaloa, Sri Lanka on August 11, 1959. A serious scholar, he began study at the University of Peridinia in 1981, but Sivaram sympathised with the Tamil struggle, and after only a year, he abandoned his studies to join the burgeoning Tamil rebellion. In the early 1990s, Sivaram made the transition from militant to journalist, Writing under the pen name Taraki, he quickly became one of the most authoritative political analysts on the island. He was uncompromising. I should say that he was uncom uncompromising when it comes to the crucial political problems. He was not compromising the Sinhali society. He was not compromising the Tamil society. He was very much critical about the LTT for a long time. He was very much critical about the Sinhala forces in the uh, south. But when he realized something, when he realized that, okay, this is the truth. This is what I believe. Then he will fight relentlessly to, uh, you know, to prove that to, the, uh, to build an awareness about, among the people. He is the biggest bridge this country had in the recent past I mean, between these two communities. Uh, by killing him, they have destroyed the bridge. Not only putting forward the Tamil cause, but he also made the singular people or the non-Tamil readers to understand the depth of it. That is very significant, you see. That this was not just a movement of some few boys who have sort of ganged up themselves, and you know. He, he showed them that this was much more uh, deep or deeper. Normally when Arthur was leaving, I never knew that he was so, I never knew that he was so popular because he wouldn't like show it. Yeah. He just walked on the road. Know, we, just... we used to just think that he was a normal freelance journalist, but then later on after he died, I was like, oh, he's your father so popular. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. It was just such a, such a, how is he, feisty person, yeah? He just would not take anything lying down. I think that's what I liked about him. He was always provocative, always provocative to the point of being absolutely irritating. You really want to tell him off and say, you know, just stop it, you know, just shut up. But he never would. And I think that's what really people remember about him, that he didn't shut up, even when his friends asked him to shut up, let alone the state or anybody else. Yeah, he just persisted. Uh, he had a wild sense of humor. Absolutely wild. Uh, he would laugh at the most unlaughable things. And maybe, yeah, you know, that's how we survive in Sri Lanka, yeah, doing the work that we do. But, and, and he had this also very uproarious laugh, you know, loud and boisterous. And sometimes, you know, you'd be in a restaurant or somewhere and he would be so loud and so disorderly. <laughs> but, um, he was also, it was interesting because when he talked politics, he was also quite serious. Huh? And I think sometimes people would observe him and think that he's just kind of some kind of buffoon. The people who knew him really knew what a like serious person he was about his politics and about his work. Because no matter what, you know, no matter how drunk or disorderly he was, he would get whatever he had to write written. And it would always be very good. He had uh, amazing knowledge about almost everything under the sun. I mean, that's the only way that I can put it. He was a very broad character. You could discuss anything with him, from literature, films, drama, culture, not only Sri Lankan. He was very conversant with Shakespeare literature. He was very conversant with the Bollywood uh, film industry. Politics are he used to give the impression of a sort of a drunken boy who goes in the evenings to, to the pubs and drinks. And